All right. Thank you again for thank you again for tuning in to another episode of Eagles Unfiltered. Co-host Connor Miles here with my co-host Ed Crass. We are on the Bled Podcast Network and we are powered by BetOnline.ag, the best sports betting website around. Ed, this is our first ever playoff podcast for Eagles Unfiltered. For to talk about the Eagles, I mean, last year we is the first year we started this podcast. The Eagles went for eleven and one. It was a very depressing season, but we still found a way to manage and get uh, get through these pods. But now it's exciting. Now we actually have something to talk about. You know, the the Eagles are exciting. You know, the best part about this all, the cherry on top of this all, this whole entire season of how what what's going so great for the Eagles is they have three first round picks, fifteenth yeah. and sixteenth overall. Ed, you know, we we kill Allie for he drafts in the twenties, but I mean, I'll take his top, you know, his top eighteen picks. I'll take it. I know Derek Barnett wasn't all that, but he still made some great plays and. In uh, clutch moments, sure. I'll take this. You know, this is good stuff going on, Ed. This team yeah. has a bright future. It looks like they're on the right direction, and they're going into Tampa Bay this week to ten- take on the defending Super Bowl champions, who I would argue are at their worst spot uh, roster-wise that they've been all season. Yeah, Sunday at one. But, yeah, this season, you're right, Connor. It's been a win-win for the Eagles. You know, this was supposed to be the transition year. You know, Jeffrey Lurie set the bar really low when he said that back in January whenever he fired Doug Peterson. They said, it's transition year. We're going to try to get younger. Uh, nobody expected a playoff bid, and especially when they were at 2-5, and five, nobody expected a playoff bid. We all thought maybe, you know, on Black Monday, which we just had here uh, this week, that Nick Sirianni might be fired after a one and done year when they were sitting at two and five. So, you know, when you look at the fact that they're in the playoffs in a transition year, it looks like they have their head coach for their, however long, you know, he can continue to do well. And they have those three first round picks you talked about next year. I mean, it was win, win, win season for the Eagles this year. The reason why these three first round picks are so important for this team is because they've tasted this immediate success before with a young quarterback and a rookie head coach, Chip Kelly, Nick Foles. They had this success before, but the thing is they didn't build upon it. It's impossible, Ed, to not build upon this with these three first round picks. And Jalen Hurts is, you know, a dual threat. He's not there as a passer yet. Obviously we all know that. And he, He's you can't say he's the Eagles franchise quarterback yet, but you can definitely say he's the Eagles starter going forward. But yeah, you know, I thought we could say that back. You mentioned Chip Kelly's first year. I mean, Nick Foles was his quarterback, right? First year. Um he started out with Vic and then Foles came out of nowhere to replace him with injury and twenty seven and two happened. And then we thought, you know, this is this is it. This is the guy. Yeah. And then they moved on. They traded him for Sam Bradford. So I mean, that's crazy. I, I don't think the Eagles will do that with Hertz. Um, but it's no, interesting. I, I struggle. I do this a lot. And I, I you know, I, I, it's funny because people do call me out on online for it. And I agree with them because this is what I, I, I do it. I compare everything to past and you can't do it this time. Th- this is different. This is going to be different. I know Eagles fans. That's, that's, that's a tough hope to hang on to that. This is going to be different, but I truly do feel it's going to be different because you have so much youth, you know, Chip Kelly believed and I don't believe Nick Sirianni is going to get this way. So this is going to be a huge thing. Chip Kelly believed his philosophy made the players. There is no way Nick Sirianni believes his philosophy made the players if he's changing his offense to fit his players' skill sets. Yeah, That's a huge benefit right there. But again, these three first-round picks, you know, this team that needs youth, this defense, especially, that needs youth, that needs to continue this transitioning that they're doing, how can you not do it any better with having the 15th and 16th overall pick of this upcoming draft and then wherever else you finish with your own pick? Yeah. I mean, God, the opportunities are limitless with this team. And it's just so different. It's such a diff- different feeling than it was when 2013 with Chip Kelly and Nick Foles. Uh, I think, you know, I and again, you talked about Nick Sirianni's two and five start, Jalen Hurts when they were really just trying to make him a passer and put a – they pretty – what the Eagles were doing to start the year off to go two and five was putting a square in a circle peg. You know, it wasn't going to fit. What came together was to letting Jalen be Jalen and then letting Nick Sirianni coach to his player's strengths. That's the huge difference maker. That's what turned this all around. But, but the thing with Jalen Hurts is, and I, I, I'm a very, I, I'm at fault for this. 
because we are a reactionary fan base. We are a reactionary media people that cover the Eagles. We are everything's reactionary because that's the city Philadelphia brings on with our sports. We 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 fall victim to it. But Jalen Hurts was always going to need time. If you consider where he was at Alabama to the player he was to Oklahoma to last year when an offense that predicated on vertical concepts to now, I mean, you're asking this guy to be four different types of players, four different types of quarterbacks, excuse me. It's a lot to put on his plate when he's so raw in terms of quarterback play anyways. He wasn't Carson Wentz coming out of North Dakota State. He wasn't Don McNabb coming out of Syracuse. This was a complete wild card in Jalen Hurts. Yeah, And the pieces are falling into place. He's showing you, I can do what it takes to lead your team to the playoffs. You can win with me. He deserves more time. He deserved more patience. And that's what we're seeing here. Because, again, I did mention he he's going to be a dual threat. He's not all there yet as the dual part. He's there in the mobility part. He needs to get there as a passer. But this whole thing needed time. And I am at fault for giving it to not enough time and being more patient because – this, I think it can work with Jalen Hurts. I think it can work with Nick Sirianni if they continue with the consistency. Like you said last episode, he hasn't had the same offense coordinator ever since he's been in since he's played football in college. Mm-hmm. It's finally time he's going to have that. Consistency is going to play a huge part in his development. And that's something that he's never had. Yeah, I agree. And listen, you know, you're not to blame for lack of patience. You know, everybody's that way. Everybody is wants it now, wants it now. They don't want to wait for the development to happen. But um, you know, you look at the opportunity now that Hertz has in front of him going into Tampa Bay to play the defending Super Bowl champions, the GOAT and Tom Brady. Look at this opportunity he has now. If the Eagles find a way to win this game with Jalen Hurts at quarterback, doing things that lead them to victory, which if the Eagles are going to win, Hertz is going to have to play well and do the right things. If he does that, look at Nick Foles. He beat Tom Brady, and people on Twitter are asking him to sign a contract to come back and play against Tampa. uh, Tampa, I almost said Tampa Brady, but Tom Brady because of what he did to him in the Super Bowl. Now, granted, you know, the wild card, super wild card round of the playoffs isn't Super Bowl 52, but the same principle is in play here that if you beat Tom Brady and the defending Super Bowl champions as the quarterback, that does wonders for a fan base's outlook on Jalen Hurts being the quarterback of the future of this team. Um, Because just look what Nick Foles, you know, he did it, and now he's a legend in the the city. So if Jalen Hurts can beat him, I'm not saying he's going to be a legend, but, man, I'll tell you, the fans are going to love this kid for engineering probably what would be the biggest upset in the playoffs, the number seven seeded Eagles with a one game above 500 record beating Tom Brady and the Super Bowl champs, if he can do it. Let's not forget this this game that they played the past against the Buccaneers was competitive. The Eagles fought them till the end, and that was with like minimal D line pressure on Tom Brady, very minimal. Uh, Antonio Brown was healthy, you know. Chris Godwin was out there. To, for everybody not giving the Eagles a chance, I think it's silly. Yeah, absolutely silly. You know, twenty eight to twenty two, they lost. Mm-hmm. The team looked like they were turning around. There were some costly mistakes in that game to lose it. Tampa's at their weakest point. Fournette's banged up. Again, it's Tom Brady in the playoffs. I'm not going to sit here and act like I'm not going to, you know, downplay my opponent. The Buccaneers are the better team on paper. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yep. But I mean, the you know, the under, underdog mentality was really adopted by this team once before. They embraced it. They won because of it. Yep. Why not try it again? Why can't they yep. do it again? Yeah, well, Tampa's got the experience of having won the Super Bowl last year, and this whole team is pretty much intact. This Eagles team is very young. You know, they're playing kids that have never been here. Hurts, Devontae Smith, Milton Williams, who's had a a terrific rookie season. You know, these are young guys. You have some good veterans, obviously, with Jason Kelsey, won a Super Bowl, and a couple others on on this team, Lane Johnson. Um, And maybe that veteran leadership will count for something. But, you know, Tampa is the more seasoned team for sure. And you're right there. You know, this whole Antonio Brown saga that blew up in their face, you know, that's kind of been a little bit of a distraction for them. Um, You know, Leonard Fournette will play, I'm sure. Bruce Arians came out and said he's probably going to be healthy Sunday. So will Jason Pierre-Paul. I mean, they're getting a lot of their injured guys back. The one they might not have back is Levante David, the linebacker. 
Uh, and, and, you know, the Eagles uh, are the best running team in football. And Bruce Arians said that they haven't done a good job of stopping the run the last two games. And since week seven, when they were the first ranked rush defense in the league, Tampa Bay has now the 15th since week seven. They're the 15th best team at stopping the run. So they've slipped a little bit. They're still third overall in doing it. Uh, but teams are trying to beat Tampa wide because Levante David's not there. Uh, Devin White, uh, their, their linebacker, is that the right guy? White? Yeah. He, he's, uh, he's not the same player he was, and I think that's because David hasn't been in there with him because David is Absolutely. such a calming influence. But teams are trying to beat Tampa Bay wide with the run game, and they've been successful at it. So, uh, you know, unless the Bucks can stop them, the Eagles are going to pose problems with their ground game. It would be helpful if they can get Miles Sanders back. You know, Nick Sirianni said earlier in the week that, you know, he's still hopeful that Sanders will return. He broke his hand a couple weeks ago. This would be three weeks since he broke his hand. So um, we'll see if – but that would help because he's their best outside threat. He can get to the edge probably quicker than any of, the, of those other backs. And that's where Tampa has been giving up those rushing yards is on the outside of that defense because yeah. the inside with William Golston and and uh, Vita Vea and, you know uh, – yeah, Vita Vea is a mo- the best so, tackle yeah, in the NFL. They're, they're brutal inside. They're hard to run against inside. So the Eagles are going to have to kind of use their zones and try to get to the edge and uh, pick up yards that way. And Hertz is very good at getting to the edge, especially with that RPO stuff he uses. He can fake the handoff and then scoot around the outside. So unless Tampa Bay buckles that up, the Eagles are going to you know, make some headway, I think, in the ground game. And in that respect, if they can control the clock, they'll keep Brady on the bench and give him less opportunities to beat them. A little move that the Eagles made that's probably not going to, you know, I mean, it catches your, everybody's eyes because the kick return, uh, you want an upgrade there. But I love Jason Huntley being added to the active roster, uh, not just because of his kick return ability and the the needed juice that the Eagles need back there, but uh, his elusiveness to the backfield is is key. You know, when the Eagles made that Super Bowl run, everybody forgets Kenyon Barner made an impact. Kenyon Barner brought some elusiveness to this team, and you know they leaned heavily on that rushing attack and the stable of running backs they've had. Jason Huntley can provide that kind of elusive spark. I'm not saying he's going to get more than one carry a game, but still, there's he had some juice in that game versus Dallas, enough to for the Eagles to think, hey, we need him for our playoff run. So I like mm-hmm. adding Jason Huntley back there. I do believe in Kenny Gainwell after the game. I'm mean, not even just the game against Dallas. The kid has shown potential time in and time out, and he he was very promising at Memphis. Uh, Jordan Howard, I know, is banged up, but Boston Scott, too. We, 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 always under, we always find a way to underrate Boston Scott. He's always the forgotten man in this backfield, but whenever he gets the ball in his hands, he is productive for this team. So, uh, yes, Miles Sanders, I, I believe he'll play. There's no way he's not going to play. But, uh, again, you're nursing a broken hand. you got to think he's going to be on a snap count. I would like to see these other guys contribute in this rushing attack, too, and you know, they, they do have some guys that I think Buccaneers are going to sleep on, and it's going to pay off for the Eagles in the in, in the ground game. Yeah, Huntley, you know, Sirianni said on Monday that Huntley probably won't play. He won't. I, I don't think he'll be active on Sunday. Oh, man, just rained um, on my parade. I know. I'm sorry, but that's, <laughs> sorry. you know, because he looked great in the, in the kickoff return game. He averaged It's a numbers point. game, though. It does make sense. I mean, it, it, it well, does yeah. make sense. And he said that, and that's what he said. He's like, you know, you can't have too many running backs active because then that affects other parts of your roster. So, you know, yes, they added him to the uh, 53-man roster when they put uh, three players on IR on Monday, uh, Brett Toth, Tyree Jackson, and J.J. Ortega-Whiteside. So they have three openings, and they filled one with Huntley. But I think that's them just acknowledging that, yeah, he played a good game and he deserves to be on our roster. Uh, you know, he has a, a, a future with us going forward and we don't want anybody to poach him and snap him up. So they added him to the roster and that makes sense. But again, it's going to be a numbers game. If Miles Sanders can play, then there's no way Huntley plays. Now, if Sanders doesn't play, then, you know, maybe they decide to sit gain. Well, I don't I don't see that happening, but it, who knows? Maybe. I mean, it was early in early in the week when Nick said that. Um, but they haven't brought up Richard Rodgers yet, you know, Tyree Jackson. Unfortunately for Tyree Jackson, another injury. He had the back, the fracture in his back, um, you know, in training camp, and he spent eight weeks on a- IR uh, rehabbing it, and then, uh, you know, he tears his ACL against Dallas. I mean, it's just a shame because he was, you know, I mean, he didn't have many catches. He didn't have any catches until 
Against no, he has Dallas. potential. He does yeah, have potential. He was a very though. important guy in the 13 personnel packages with the Eagles use a lot of, you know, with three tight ends on the field. So now they'll probably elevate Richard Rodgers into that role. He hasn't been at it yet, but that's a move that will come this week. Um, and, you know, you could say that maybe he's even better than Tyree Jackson blocking. Having so we'll, Richard Rodgers in the postseason is a power move. Yeah, yeah. And it speaks to the, some of the depth that this team has. And, again, it speaks to Howie Roseman putting together a roster that's in the playoffs. You know, somehow, some way, he got this roster into the playoffs. I'm not being a goof either. Go watch Richard Rodgers in Green Bay in the playoffs. The guy makes plays. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He does. He does. He had a great, does, year, yeah. great year last year. I think he had 24 catches. For and he had the Hail Mary. 90 yards. Hail Mary against Seattle. Yeah. I mean, he'll be the guy. He'll be the third tight end behind Stoll and Goddard. So, um, I think Stoll has been very underrated in the ground game this year. Yeah. He's a good blocker. Very underrated. Know? You know, for all the Eagles fans, because I remember this, we always complain about not having a fullback anymore, not having a fullback anymore. Jack Stoll, I mean, is the tight end fullback of this team he he's good you know we talk about this 2018 draft class and we harp on it for praising howie let's start doing it for the 2021 class you know they got some guys in this class all of them have contributed at some point in the at, uh, at this season and they don't even have to be drafted to Jack souls undrafted free agent that made this roster so uh yeah. this 2020 class looks like the best class they could possibly have for a transition year and now 2021 is only gonna be better yeah, I mean, listen, if you don't oh, have yeah. this, you know, this 21 class, you know, Smith has had an impact, Dickerson's had an impact, Williams has had an impact, Gainwell's had an impact. If you don't have those guys on this team, I don't think you're in the playoffs, you know, veteran no. leadership aside. But they don't go to playoffs without Devontae Smith. No, and they've come in and they've, you know, they've contributed to this team in a huge way. So, uh, yeah, the future is bright as far as this class goes. The 2020 class – you know, maybe. I mean, you got Hertz obviously in that class. He's huge. I messed that up. I meant to say twenty twenty one class, and then the twenty twenty two class can be yeah. strong. Sorry. Yeah, no, but you're right. I mean, the twenty eighteen and the twenty one classes are, you know, good reasons to hope that this team has a future. And then you mix in hopefully what will be a good draft in twenty two. And you know, this is an ascending team. There's no no question about that. Can I ask you something? Yeah. What. What was your reaction when J.J. Arcega Whiteside drops that wide open touchdown? And I'll tell you, it's a, <laughs> I don't see how he can continue to play for this team going forward. I really don't. I mean, you cut Travis Fulgham. You wonder, would Travis Fulgham make that catch? Uh, would yes. they have stuck with their offensive pass interference call had he caught it? I mean, you know, he was the refs discussed a flag that was thrown on that play of offense P.I., but it wasn't. He should have been him. flagged. But yeah, yeah. Up, but it, you got to make that catch. I mean, my goodness, it hit him right in the right in the bread basket. You know, you have to secure that catch. I, it's a shame because you know you hate to see you know guys like JJ Ortega Whiteside, who I like as a person. Obviously, a lot of these guys, but if you can't play, you can't play. And, yeah, and he can't play. Move, yeah, and you have to move on. And this is his third year in the league, and I know they rave about his special teams ability, but. That's not enough to keep him around. You have to be able to catch the football when it's Matthew Slater away. makes that catch. Yeah. Matthew I mean, Slater, the best special teams wide receiver in NFL history, makes that catch. That's all I'm going to say. So get rid of Arstega Whiteside. Move on. Despicable. Uh, I I saw red when he chopped that. I can't believe it. Yeah, you. Can, I think we could have made that catch. Yeah. Matt Collins would have made that catch. Oh, Matt Collins would definitely made that catch. He's make he makes the crazy insane catches with Miami right now. Four touchdown catches this year. I think they're only I only I only think he has five receptions, but four of them are touching. He's like the Greg Ward of their of the Dolphins team. <laughs> yeah, Greg Ward, man. Uh yeah, he didn't. Yeah, play I I just brought that up because I you're there. You're in the press box. I watched it on TV and I was infuriated. I can't imagine, you know, having to write about this game in person and seeing that and think, man, they spent a second round pick on this guy. Over Terry McLaurin and DK Metcalf. What the heck? For as much for as much as we killed Jalen Rager, which he deserves, I will say he deserves. I, I I can't even honestly say he makes that catch either. I'm sorry. But at least he shows a little bit. He shows a little bit. Or should, I think a way side showed nothing. Nothing except for that fumble recovery against the Ravens last year. But that other than that, it's like, oh. 
he had a big catch earlier this game earlier this season. I can't remember who it was against. It was third and long. Oh yeah, yes, it did. It was against the Giants. Yeah, against the Giants, and really kind of jump started him there on a drive. It was like a 19 yard gain. He catched. It was a catch and run. He whenever they like, wore the all black jerseys, because I don't know if it was the Giants for a fact, but it was whenever they wore the all black jerseys. He had like yeah, a 40 some yard catch. That was the best. That was his career highlight right there. Yeah, he's really wide was. open because nobody took him seriously. That was a play action play. He's wide open. Nobody. He's on the left side of the field. Nobody even saw him. I, I remember like it was yesterday. Now, Wait. I don't know. I, it's That's, it's a shame. I mean, it's you know they they whiffed on it and. You know how he, you know, he's got a lot of previous sins, Roseman. But again, I think this year he he's done a good job building this roster out. With Let's talk the, about that. Let's yeah. talk about that because you know we all like to harp on his negatives, right? But he's in the playoffs. Rick Spielman, who drafted Justin Jefferson and laughed at Harry Roseman, is unemployed, not in the playoffs. Mm-hmm. So for all these draft whiffs. That we all crucify him for, he overcomes them. Want to know how he overcomes them is because he makes really good damn trades. He does. He does. He makes really good signings. You know, he. You know, I I know they're not all great. Ryan Kerrigan, for example, but he, there's way more good signings than there's bad signings. The good outweighs the bad sometimes with Harry Roseman, and we always like to forget that or overlook it. Yeah, I mean, again, the grass I mean, isn't always greener. The grass isn't always greener. I'm just going to say that right now. Look at Minnesota. Look at Chicago. The grass is not always greener. He will never be forgiven for picking Jalen Rager over Justin Jefferson, though. And a lot of and fans he should be. That was a mortal sin for him to do that. I mean, Justin Jefferson's the first receiver to have over 3,000 yards receiving in his first two years. I mean, that that's that's huge. They picked Reggie Wayne. I mean, excuse me, they picked Freddie, Ridge, Freddie Mitchell over Reggie Wayne before and overcame it. This is going to have to be another one they overcome. Well, I mean, they vo- they're they in the playoffs, and the Vikings are not in the playoffs, and they're getting a new coach and a new GM. So, you know, in a sense, they have overcome it in the short term. We'll see about the long term. Um, but, you know. Devontae uh, Smith, I just want to say Devontae Smith lessens the blow. We got to move on. We got to move on. Really good, and you know we'll see who they get as a a number two next year. And you know what, Quez Watkins, he had a pretty nice year. I mean, he had six hundred and fifty yards received. Has a role. Has a role Um, for sure. He has a role. I'm not sure he's a number two, but listen, I think he's their slot. Yeah, but and this is an offense that goes through Devontae and and Dallas, and yeah, it'd be nice to have a good number two, and and maybe Quez can be that. But you know. the number two is not going to see a whole lot of targets when you have Devontae and Dallas and whatever uh, running game you're going to have next year, which I think will still be pretty substantial like it was this year. So, you know, when you're running the ball 30 times a game and you're throwing it 25 to 30, where are your targets? You know, you're going to throw some to the running back. You're going to try to get Devontae five or six, Dallas five or six, running backs three or four. I mean, you really are only talking about another five or six targets and, you know, who are you going to go to there? So I don't know. They should trade for Calvin Ridley. They should. I mean, I know we're getting way too ahead into this now because I want to yeah. focus on the playoffs, but they should They should make that move for Calvin Ridley because uh, I would like to see guys who can get yak, get open in space, and thrive in the middle of the field for Jalen Hurts. And that's yeah. Calvin Ridley to a T to me. Um, I think that would be the perfect addition to this team. And forget this first-round pick talk for him. It's not going to happen. He doesn't take a first-round pick to get him. Yeah. You, you you call up Atlanta. You say, hey, you got a bad offensive line problem. I'll give you the second round pick and Andre Dillard for Calvin Ridley. Or I'll give you, you know, you guys are going to have to rebuild that whole entire wide receiver room. Jalen Rager needs a change of scenery. You know, this guy has some potential. Maybe you can tap into it, but it's not going to happen in Philadelphia. Here's a second round pick in Jalen Rager. Stop with the first round pick talk. The, the guy missed a lot of games. He wants out of Atlanta. I know, again, his mental health is very important. It was very important for Lane Johnson. The Eagles gave him the time. They took care of him the way they should have. This mm-hmm. is a great atmosphere for Calvin Ridley to come into uh, after what they did with Lane Johnson. So he can rest assured in that aspect. He's back with his college quarterback, back with his college wide receiver teammate. Uh, perfect situation for Calvin Ridley. He'll take a second round pick and then maybe a, p- a player with potential. And you get yeah. him. First, you got to see if he wants to keep playing. I mean, there's whispers that he might just retire, but you're right. I mean, if he. Right. If he can see a situation where, hey, I might be able to be happy in that situation. I go back with my that. college quarterback. I go back with my college wide receiver. I ran routes with all the time. Yeah. Like I, It's a good situation for him. And, you know, this team can build around still, too, with taking on Calvin Ridley's salary. 
Uh, I think Hertz and Ridley were roommates at Alabama too. They so, were. They were. I mean, they had a good connection. They did have a good connection to Alabama. So I think it would be a great situation for Cal Ridley coming to Philadelphia here. And I think you know, I'm not looking for a deep threat right guy. Everybody's stuck on this wide. We need a big body X receiver. Devontae really is their X. You know, the X receiver is your number one receiver. He's not a prototypical special physical specimen. He's he's your number one guy. That's Devontae. They need a guy that can get yak, who can get open for Jalen Hurts to fit in these windows for his accuracy issues. And that's Calvin Ridley. It's Calvin Ridley for me. He would help in the middle of the field too as well in that area of Jalen Hurts' passing. But again, we're getting a little too ahead of ourselves. I actually wanted to circle back to this higher Roseman conversation because you actually made a very controversial article that not a lot of people agreed with because nobody in this town can give Harry Roseman credit for when he turns things around after he creates a mess. So you said, why can't Harry's name be considered for executive of the year? And you made a very, very strong case for it that. I'll let you explain, but I agree. You know, I don't, he doesn't deserve to win it, but his name, if we're going to put Nick Sirianni's name in this coach of the year candidates, why not Harry Roseman who had to overcome the most dead cap in league history and acquire three first round picks in a playoff, uh, appearance yeah you know and someone you know, i did get a lot of heat for that and i expected to you know i mean like i said that taking rager over jefferson's a mortal sin in people's eyes and they can't move past that um but then i was just talking about this year you know people want to drag up his previous sins and that's not what i was doing i was just focused on 2021 and what he did and you mentioned the the dead cap stuff carson wentz their highest paid player isn't even on their team um they have uh you know, they had this huge dead dead cap at second largest in the league, 66 million. Um, yet he was able to kind of, I know he kicked a lot of the pain down the road a little bit, future pain down the road with some of the contract extensions he had, uh, or contracts he had to rework. But again, he was able to do it. He, and he brought in some guys that aren't superstars, some free agent signings who, again, like their draft class, which is another reason. I mentioned how he is a possible executive of the year, but the free agents without these guys, without Jordan Howard, without Anthony Harris, without uh, Steven Nelson, they're probably not in the playoffs again, you know? Uh, so yeah, he missed on some free agents, Ryan Kerrigan, Eric Wilson. Uh, yeah, sure. But again, you are going to miss everything he touched in 2017 turned to gold when he signed guys and traded for, uh, you know, Jay Ajayi at the deadline. But um, just this year alone, I think he's done enough with a roster that was supposed to be in transition to warrant conversation. Now, someone brought up, and I thought it was a good point, that maybe he should be the comeback GM of the year based on what he was able to kind of overcome the messes that he created. So, you know, maybe comeback GM is better than, you know, GM of the year. But I, I just think he'll, he should be in the conversation. He won't win it, but, you know – you can't overlook his role and, you know, how the Eagles have gotten to this point in this season, this season only. Um, they're not in the playoffs without the moves that he made, free agent-wise, draft class-wise, and then laying the foundation for future success with the three draft picks, two draft picks, really, that he got in trades and then their own, which was right now, I think, number 19. So, um I don't know. I mean, I expected the heat. People just can't forgive G Roseman. And, he, and and some of the heat I got was, well, he drafted Rager and not Jefferson. And now he, you know, he, he doesn't even use Dillard. I mean, these, these are previous years. I'm just talking about 2021 and that's it. And I think he deserves a lot of credit for this year. Now you could take issue with him for previous seasons for sure. And some of the messes he created, but he's able to dig himself out. And that's not the word. The words based on what you did this, this year. Yeah, so. exa exactly. Exactly. It's based on this year. So, uh, you know, people don't want to see it that way. They want to kind of drag up everything he's done in the past. And, and you could do that. But then you could you got to factor in they took Mulata. And people don't give him any credit for Mulata. They say it was Stoutland. But it was Roseman who called Stoutland hours before he went on vacation and said, we need you to go to Florida to check this guy out. And Stoutland's like, really? You know, Stoutland tells the story. He's like, really? You know, I'm getting ready to get out the door to go golfing with my buddies for a week. And now I got to go to Florida. Then he went down, he saw him a lot, I loved him, came back and said, I love the guy, and they ended up taking him uh, based on Stoutland's report. But it's not like he banged the table and said, yeah, we got to have him, we got to have him. Um, you know, if you're going to give credit, uh, Roseman blame for some of these mistakes, you got to give him credit for Mulata. You got to give him credit for Josh Sweat in the fourth round. Um, you know, 
we have problem. Maddox in the fourth round. I mean, <coughs> you know, he, he played a hand in, and yeah, he whiffed, and GM's whiff. Uh, you can't give me a GM out there that hasn't spent badly in the draft. Look at John Lynch. Somebody brought up John Lynch, the 49ers guy. His first year as the GM, he had two first-round picks. He took Solomon Thomas and Reuben Foster. I think that's his name, the linebacker. Yeah. Yep. I mean, both those guys were busts, you know, and, and okay, so John Lynch doesn't get any – Blame for those two picks. He, you know, he's got his team back in the playoffs, and they went to the Super Bowl. Rick Spielman had two first round picks. Got Justin Jefferson fell into his lap, and then he took Jeff Gladney, and he's a criminal. Yeah, I mean, GMs, yeah, I mean, listen, it's not an easy job, and uh, you know, and and Roseman, even if you want to revisit all his past mistakes, you have to throw some of the successes in there too. Playoffs for the last five years, Super Bowl four years ago. I mean, you know, that to me speaks well, they- volumes. What bothers me about the draft? It's a crapshoot, people. Situations matter. Coaching matters. What you, what, what you get what you get drafted into matters. That's why when you know free agents leave that or look when Malcolm Jenkins left the Saints, he became a completely different player on the Eagles. He was a good player for the Saints, but he became elite on the Eagles. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. The draft is a crapshoot. You can get a guy who has talent and who never lives up to it with the Eagles. And then he goes on, I'm not even just saying the Eagles, it's just the NFL in general, goes on to a different team that fits him better, that coaches to his skill set better, and he becomes a, the player that everybody thought he was in the draft. Yeah, You know, it's it, it's a crapshoot. There's so much that goes into the draft that to, to, give, to fault some guy for all his misses, like you said, you have to give credit for the stuff he does hit on because it's such a crapshoot. Yeah. Uh, and that's what bothers me the most when we talk about this stuff is because, yeah. you know, I, I'm not a Howie apologist by any means. Uh, I thought after last season, if you're going to fire the head coach, you got to fire the GM too. Right. But it, he turned this whole thing around. He did. And not only that, he's going to look really good after this Carson Wentz trade. I'm telling you right now, he's going to look really, really good getting out underneath that contract. And I know the speculation is going to start, well, they wanted him back or they wanted to make it work. It doesn't matter. Guess what happened? He traded him. He got the most maximum value he could possibly get for him, and he's going to look smarter at the end of it too. That's that's the way it's trending right now. And, and people want to blame him for extending Wentz in the summer of 2019. Well, you know. Oh, that's dude, stupid. Sh- shouldn't they have seen this coming? But listen, you know, okay, maybe he, – you, you no, it doesn't matter. Mean, you pay a quarterback when you can pay a quarterback, and you take right. advantage of the market before the market develops because nobody – I don't care. His crystal ball did not see 2020 happening. Nobody did. No. You're a liar if you did. Even the Carson Wentz haters never thought he would be like that bad. So that's hindsight, 2020. Right? That's mm-hmm. that's all that is because when your quarterback needs to get paid and you have an opportunity to pay him below market value before the market sets in, you pay him every yeah. single time. No, no second guessing, no nothing like that. Um, yeah. Carolina Panthers are getting ridiculed right now for picking up Sam Darnold's fifth year option, and Matt Rule laughed about it when he was asked about it in his press conference. He was so smug, and if I was a Panthers fan, I would have saw red because he was yeah. laughing when he was talking about it. It was a collective effort. He's he's giggling and stuff. They didn't care because they said. If he ends up becoming the starter we believe he's going to be, that's below market value, the fifth-year option. We get great starter money out of that. that that's just, just what how this works. That's how the league works. Every team would have paid Carson Wentz at that time if they could take advantage of the market. So uh, killing him for that. Killing him for Andre Dillard silly, too. You know, they didn't know Jordan Mulata was going to pan out and be what he was. They needed a backup plan behind Jason Peters, who fell down and got injured every week he rolled him out there. And, and I, I got news for you. Dillard, Dillard's not bad. I mean, he hasn't played a lot this year, but the games he's been in, he, he's played pretty well. I mean, he's no, he's going to net them something good in the trade. He's not this giant bust that everybody seems to think he is. And yeah, I mean, if they trade him, I think they can get something of value for him for sure. But they may not trade him. They may hang on to him because he's a cheap, inexpensive swing tackle. Um, that every team needs. I mean, Halapula Vati Vaitai was in that role. Um, Matt Pryor kind of failed in that role. Uh, they got Driscoll for that role. Now, yeah, yeah. Driscoll I think they're going to trade Andre Dillard because of the first round pick salary. I think eventually that's going to hit in, and they're going to yeah. maximize on his value. I, he's going to whatever I'm telling you though, Ed. In an offensive line starved league, especially left tackle, they're yeah. going to cash in. Mm-hmm. They're going to cash in. They're going to get a good player back for Andre Dillard or good value back for Andre Dillard. That's going to get. 
then you're going to look at Howie and say, wow, we're a genius. No. Maybe the Colts will take him for a first round pick. They need a left tackle. They <laughs> yeah, need a left tackle. You know, so. They traded Carson for a first round. You know, I mean, and and again, I give Howie credit. Okay, you had to trade Carson Wentz because Wentz wouldn't have been happy coming back. Okay. Howie may not have wanted to trade him, but he really had to trade him. Carson wasn't look, coming back. He wasn't coming uh, back. And he wasn't coming back happy if he was coming back at all. And you don't want that in your locker room, you know. So I give Howie credit. I mean, and listen, they were fortunate that the Colts really, you know, they had a f- history with them with Frank Reich and Chris Boward. They they knew Wentz, so they were able to make the deal happen. Um, but it happened. And now in Indianapolis, they're talking about what what can they do to cut him? How much money will it cost them? Um, so, you know, I, I give Howie credit Not there. Even that. Forget yeah. about what people are talking about. Frank White last year was asked if Philip Rivers – wants to play again in the NFL next year, is he your quarterback? And he said, absolutely, I would take Phillip Rivers back as my starting quarterback next year. Yeah. He asked the same question about Carson Wentz, and he gave the most not-sure answer you could possibly give. That's damning. That's your guy. That was supposed to be your guy. And not only that, when people didn't go back for Carson in Philadelphia, guess what happened? He pouted and wanted out. Yeah. I'm just saying, guys, at the end of this, whatever happens with Carson Wentz in Indianapolis, no matter what, at this point now, the Eagles are going to look – how going to look smarter at the end of this deal? I'm telling you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the Colts are up against it now. They don't have a quarterback. They don't have a first-round pick. Um, you know, and, and the Eagles are to blame for that. I mean – That's my favorite song, my friend. Yeah. But – Let's let's focus back onto this game. Let's yes. let's right end the show with this Eagles Buccaneers game. What are the keys to victory for the Eagles? Run the ball. Got to run, run the, the ball. ball. You have to be successful running the football. And the Eagles have done that. I mean, it, it, listen, they they played Dallas with their backups, and they still ran for 149 yards with with an offensive line with Casey Tucker a little bit, Sua Pita, uh, Jack Anderson. Um, most of Dallas starters were out there too. That's a good run defense. Yeah, and they had Kenny Gainwell and Jason Huntley as their prime running backs, and they still had 149 yards rushing. Uh, so yeah, I think they're going to be able to run the ball, and then you have to be able to. And you said it at the top, Connor, that they didn't really do a good job of pressuring Brady in the first game and the first time around. And and if they don't do that, then you know Brady's just going to sit there and surgically dice them up, and. What concerns me is their tight ends. The Eagles have been hurt by tight ends all year. I'm not sure Cameron Brait will play. He's got a hamstring issue. I think he suffered in the season finale. He, he'll probably play, but um, Gronkowski is just – Yeah, phenomenal. Gronk is Gronk. Yeah. I mean, that that connection scares me because the Eagles can't cover tight ends. They've shown the inability all year to do that. So, I mean, you're going to have to put pressure on Brady. You're going to have to move him off his spot. You're, and this is a good Tampa offensive line. Um, but you're really going to need Javon Hargrave, Fletcher Cox, Derek Barnett, Josh Sweat. Those guys need to show up, and they need to figure out a way to keep Brady off balance. You can't show him any look that's going to confuse him. He's been at it too long. But you're going to have to try to blitz guys when you can blitz guys and then cover if you do. Uh, so that's the key to me is you're going to have to pressure Brady as best you can with four-man fronts and maybe blitz a little bit. Um and then you have to run the football. Uh, there's no doubt you have to run the football. And then Jalen Hurts is a big key to the victory, too, is how he operates in a pressure-filled situation in his first playoff start, the youngest quarterback in Eagles history to start a playoff game. How's he going to do? You know, How's he going to bear up in a huge situation here? So it's really going to be how Jalen Hurts plays, if they can run the ball, and if they can somehow find a way to, you know, to put – pressure on Brady to make him feel a little bit uncomfortable. We saw them do it in the Super Bowl a little bit, even though he threw for over 500 yards. You got to have somebody step up and make a play on Brady. That's, you know, who's it going to be? Is it going to be Barnett, Sweat, somebody else? Um, that That's a key. So the Eagles got lucky and Gronk didn't play this season against. Right, that's Eagles, right. But, but in the Super Bowl, 9-116, two touchdowns. Yeah, it's it, that's a big concern. They do struggle with tight ends. It's it's been going on for a little bit. So this, no. I know, comparing apples and oranges, comparing the Super Bowl team to the Eagles team now, especially with the different coaching. But they do struggle with tight ends still. Uh, yep. Gronk is going to be a huge test. Do not sleep on Gronk for because of 
his age or who he is. I mean, th- this this is going to be huge for the Eagles. That's Brady's number one target, I think. Uh, yeah. Mike Evans against Darius Slay, I have no worry for. Um, okay. Scotty Miller is a player, though. I'll let all Eagles fans know now from a guy living in Florida, Scotty Miller, their uh, wide receiver that's essentially replacing Antonio Brown. I know they had uh, the Grayson, Serial Grayson, too, that's stepped up lately, but he got banged up. Uh, Brashard Perryman is a guy I know we're all familiar with. He's a speedster. He he has been making plays for Brady, but Scotty Miller and Brady have a, a dynamic connection. He's like, they call him his mini Edelman. Um, and he has speed. He has a lot of speed. So, you know, I know that we're all harping on the on the Buccaneers wide receivers and the, the lack thereof, but they do have some guys on that depth chart that can make some plays. Avante Maddox and Steven Nelson are going to have to come to play. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think it's, probably too big of a task to go down to Tampa and beat the Super Bowl champs. Um, I don't, you know, I would probably pick Tampa to win this game. Um, but that wouldn't, you know, belittle anything the Eagles have done this season for sure. I mean, they've set themselves up for a good future ascension. No, they're going to get, uh, hey, Ed, I'll tell you right now, they're going to give this Tampa team a run for their money. Yeah. And I think just this, getting the playoff experience for guys like Hertz and Dickerson and Smith and Milton Williams, uh, you know, Sirianni. Sirianni, right, right. His staff. I mean, yeah, it's it, that. This is huge. And Sirianni said on Monday that they're just going to approach this like it's a regular season game. They're going to try to approach it the same way. You know, they're not going to put any more pressure on these guys. They're just going to say it's just another game. And you know, you hope that message gets through. Yeah, Frank Reich hasn't been the same since Nick Sirianni left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know how many times I had to hear that about Doug Peterson. <laughs> You know, you know how many times I had to hear that, man. It, it's a little, yeah. it's a little relieving to you know make that joke now. But yeah, you got to put it all on Reich, man. They blew two games down the stretch. They sh- all they need is one win in two games, and they couldn't get it done. For all the hype Sean McVay's gotten for his for his first season with the Los Angeles Rams or what the St. Louis Rams at the time, I guess they were. But Nick Sirianni deserves the same. You know, I know they started two five, not a very exciting team, and they run the ball. They're not something that's going to pass all over you. That doesn't excite the general NFL audience. Mm-hmm. But very creative coach, a guy who turned his whole entire philosophy around, mind you, in year one of his head coaching job. Yeah, and flipped it on a dime and went seven and two. I'm just saying. This guy's for real, and if we're going to hype up Sean McVay as this young, up-and-coming offensive coach at the time that we did, I believe Nick Sirianni should be looked at in the same light. Why isn't the media not giving him the the hype that he deserves? Why is he not blossoming like a flower in their eyes? (laughs) Yeah, I mean... It's it's a little odd to me, though, because even when you make these Coach of the Year graphics, he's nowhere to be found. You know, it took Mike Florio, a person who I think is despicable to mention Nick Sirianni as a coach of the year candidate. He's the only one in media who has it's national media. I'm speaking. I'm not talking about our local coverage. I'm talking about national recognition. Mm -hmm. Like Sean McVay has done nothing in the NFL besides lose a Super Bowl. You know, score three points for for all the hype he gets. Yeah. For all the hype he gets, Wade Phillips is just way more hype for that Super Bowl. But for all the hypes he gets, he has nothing to really show for it. Why should we not hype up guys who are like Nick Sirianni, yeah. you know, who have all the cards stacked against them and come out and do everything he's doing? You know, I just want to see that him mentioned among these up and coming hot head coaches because he is, you know, everybody ranked him as the worst hire. Go back and eat your words. Go back and give him his flowers. He deserves it. I agree. I, just, man. I need I, agree. I just need more respect put on Nick Sirianni's name. That's all I want. Well, if they beat the Bucks, they'll get the respect. Do you think they can do it? Do you think they can go down to Tampa and get yes. this game? Yes, I do. You know, Tom Brady is amazing. Best quarterback of all time. Yep. You can beat him in the wild card. It's happened. It has happened. You're catching the Buccaneers at their weakest point. And a fact that you made known in this show has not been harped on enough. Levante David is the heart and soul of that defense. If he is out... Yeah, that is a very, very big loss. I would say it would probably if I had to give a ranking of the most important players on that defense, Levante David would be number one. Uh, Vita Vaya would be Vita Vea would be number two. That's how important those guys are to that defense. Mm-hmm. 
not having Levante Davis is really going to hurt them, especially with that secondary being banged up as it is, as uh, has, has been all entire season long. I know it's not like the Eagles are a passing team, but I mean, this is the game where, you know, you've seen this progress from Hurts. That pass against Washington to Greg Ward is something that great Jalen Hurts does not do these first couple weeks in the season. He mm-hmm. He's come the long way as a passer. This is a game where he should probably lean on his arm a little bit more too. He should trust his arm. Not lean on it. He should trust his arm a little bit more this game. He should trust what he's seeing a little bit more this game because this is a, a very beatable team. It is. You know, they are Super Bowl winning champs. They have Tom Brady. Bruce Arians is a really great head coach, but this team as it is right now is very beatable with their injuries, with everything they're high, and the Eagles are hot. They are. I know they rested their starters. I know they start out slow in the first half, but they are a very hot team, and catching a hot team at the right time always pans out bad for the team that's banged up. But we'll see. I, I, I'm i not saying the Eagles are a win, but I, I have way more hope than you do. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I just I just don't see how they can stop Brady. I mean. That would be crazy. I'll tell you right now. I'm I'm not even saying they will. Hey, they didn't stop Brady before, and they still beat him. Yeah, that's true. It was a different team. Um, They're way different team. Way different team. Way different, different coaching. Coaches, but, but yeah, I, Jonathan Gannon's going to have, and we're going to talk to him this week, and it's going to be interesting to see what he thinks. But um, he's got to come up with a good game plan, a better game plan than he had in the opener. And then, you know that game they played against Dallas, he didn't even do any. I mean, he just rushed four guys. Yeah, he didn't care. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah there's he no care. effort that game. So, yeah. But. Yeah, Him so getting the uh, to see what kind of plan he devises for Brady. A shame that it took us 46 minutes to get into this, but one of the episode this way. Jonathan Gang getting the head coaching interview in Denver it makes complete sense because of his track record with George Patton, the Denver Broncos GM who used to be formerly of the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, when Jonathan Gannon really started out his coaching career, if anybody knows Jonathan Gannon, it's George Patton, and he knows him better than the Eagles fans. So, uh, our words and our encouragement for them hiring Jonathan again does little to nothing for them. They, they, I don't even think he's viewing what happened with this Eagles season uh, as a negative towards hiring Gannon. I think he would probably take it more as a positive because I think many people, from what it sounds like, more people think Jonathan Gannon is a better coach than what the Eagles defense gave him personnel wise. So yeah. we'll see. I mean, I don't think he's going to get Denver's job. No, but if he has connections like this in the in the league that are that good to get you into the door to this interview, uh, it's going to happen again. So it might not be this year, but it could be next year. We'll see. But it, I, I would I wonder maybe maybe we're wrong about Jonathan Gannon. You know, maybe maybe I'm wrong because I know I've been very harsh on him. But maybe maybe this is a good guy. I mean, let's see what we can do when we give him all these young kids that we're about to give him this draft when we retool this defense. Yeah, I think he needs to get better personnel for sure. But, you know, it's interesting to speculate if he takes the job. I mean, then you have the D.C. opening, and I know everybody loves Mike Zimmer, and looks like Brian Flores will probably end up as a head coach somewhere, but he's out there. But then you have the in-house guy, Denard Wilson, who, you know, Darius Slay really went to bat for, you know, their DB coach saying, you know, this guy should be a defensive coordinator. So, you know, if Gannon does leave, and I, too, don't think he's going to leave, I think that, you know, they're casting such a wide net in Denver. I think he's one of 10 names that have been mentioned that are going to be interviewed. Oh, 15. Yeah, it's insane. Yeah, but Denard Wilson, you know, people don't want to – everybody wants the hot coordinator, the, you know, the hot former head coaches. But, you know, Denard Wilson, I think, would probably make a whole lot of sense to be elevated into that spot if Gannon were to leave. Yeah, we always want the big vanges of the world. But I don't I don't think uh, – yeah, yeah. I don't think he's coming to Philly anytime soon. No, I don't either. I really think they would probably stay in house with Denard Wilson. I mean, and that would make great sense. You know, a, a, a hot. I think he's Denard a Wilson's player. a good coach. Denard yeah, Wilson's he's a real a good, good coach. coach. Yeah, and uh, I think you give him an opportunity. You know, they gave Gannon an opportunity, but listen, I don't think Gannon's going to go anywhere. I think he'll be back next year. Um, maybe Denard Wilson goes somewhere to be at DC. We'll see. All right. Well, that's going to end it for us, real quick. I, I. I'm not, I don't want to say who's going to win or lose. Playoff games are unpredictable, but I do believe in the Eagles' chances. I do believe, and I think it's going to be a really good game. It's going to come down to the wire. Uh, those Buccaneers-Eagles playoff matchups from the early 2000s uh, were tough, tough football games. I'm hoping that this can become that again, uh, but more on the Eagles' side this time, obviously. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, History is not that great with the Barber's interception still 
plays in my head a lot. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was a long time ago, and the Eagles had success against Brady. So, I mean, I don't know. I just don't. I just think it's a really tall task for a young team with no. This real is a tough task. A very tough team. task for sure. Yeah, very Absolutely. little playoff experience at key positions versus a very seasoned veteran team in Tampa on Tampa's home turf. Tough one. It's going to be tough. This isn't the end of the Eagles, though. That's all I'll tell you right now. This is no. only the beginning. Only right. the beginning for them, regardless of the outcome of this game. It's it, definitely something to put put your hat on uh, and keep building going forward. All right, guys, that'll do it for us. We'll see you next week. Thank you again for tuning in. Go Birds.